how to fight to the end because, guys, this fight and finishing is a fight. It is fighting the good fight of faith. Uh, it is not something where uh, if you watch some of the boxing, uh, Olympic boxing, it's not a matter of just getting my gloves up and just try to make it through to the end of the bell. But it is fighting the good fight of faith. And so I, I just, I, I don't want to just endure. Do y'all? I want to fight. And I, I really want to, I want uh, our church, I want us to thrive for the glory of God. I don't want us to just survive. Amen. That sounds pretty good, Pastor. That's great. You're rhyming now. Yes, I don't want to just survive. I want us to thrive. You know, I don't want us to just go, you know, people think and talk about the Christian life just being the misery of enduring all of the pain and suffering and, and, and turmoil of this world, guys. But I, I want us to encounter the peace of Christ, the joy of Christ, the joy in the journey, enjoying God and thriving in our relationship with Christ, in our relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and as the church to be about his business of seeing people's lives change for the glory of God. There's a lot of joy in that, amen? And we've been promised that this is, these are things that are going to be happening in churches where the lampstand, the presence of God dwells, that we're going to see God working in ways that are miraculous, that are amazing. And so I don't want us just to survive. I want us to thrive, church. I want to look at a couple of verses before we get into our text today. Uh, look back with me at verse 12, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. There are two key verses that are kind of going to be theme verses for this, this mini-series. And honestly, I should have taken off on this um, weeks ago. Pretty much everything we've been talking about is, is dealing with fighting the good fight of faith, finishing our race. Look here with, with me at verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. And you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Several, several weeks ago, we uh, looked at this verse specifically, verse 12 of fighting the good fight of faith. But I want to I highlight again 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, if you, you can turn there or just look here on the screen. 2 Timothy 4, 7. The Apostle Paul, writing to Timothy, his second letter, most believe this was between two and five years. Most scholars put it closer to five years. From 1 Timothy 6, 12, from his first letter of, hey, Timothy, fight the good fight of faith, take hold of the eternal life with which you were called. We just read that from 1 Timothy Five years later, second imprisonment of Paul in Rome, 2 Timothy 4, 7, he says this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Five years later, he's saying, I have fought the good fight. I believe the Apostle Paul knew in this circumstance, in this place in his life, that his race was, his race was coming to a very quick close, as we know historically that it did, by him being executed uh, for his faith, for his love for Jesus Christ. He had fought and he had finished the course. That's encouraging to me, church, amen? That means that you too, you and I too, we can fight the good fight of faith and we can finish our course. We don't just have to survive. We can thrive as we live our life for the glory of God. The, the fighting of this, we've looked at several things and last week. We talked about that actually, um, how do we finish? What are things that are part of our life that, cause us or enable us to finish this race. Uh, we looked at several of them last week, and we'll pick up with this list, but we looked last week at knowing God. Uh, he says, I charge you in the presence of God. 
that knowing God, knowing him, knowing his attributes, knowing who he is will help us endure. It will encourage us. It will give us longevity. It will give us the power to keep fighting this fight. Then we talked about worshiping in the presence of God. We talked about the, the importance of he says, I charge you in the presence of God. We talked about the importance of being in worship. We talked about the importance of being present. We talked about being here while Jesus is here, that he's bef he came before us, amen? He was here this morning before we got here. He was ready to meet with us, and now we have come into his presence today, worshiping him and glorifying him. We talked about that last week. But y'all, be worshiping in the presence of God it's got to be a part of your Christian life. It's got to be a part of your uh, fighting because the presence of God, hearing the word of God in the presence of God, knowing God in the presence of God is going to enable us to finish well, to fight well. Knowing God as our creator, uh, I charge you in the presence of God, it gives life to all things. We talked about that last week as well. And we've reiterated this point. We could go back to it a hundred times and look at, different things that relate to God's creative power. But listen to me, church, we need God's creative power in our life every day. God's supernatural, miracle-working power. I listened to a preacher this morning on the way here that was dumbing down, watering down the Word of God. He said the, he said the fishes and loaves, the fishes and loaves came with the people. The 5,000 people already had the fish and already had the loaves, and the miracle was that Jesus showed up and helped people <laughs> to help people not be stingy. So they just shared all their fish and their loaves. That's not the way I read the story, church. This neo-orthodoxy, this new way of looking at the Bible, this dumbing down and watering down and taking out the miracles, friends, this is not what we need in our lives as the church. We need the presence of God. We need the presence of the Creator. God, listen, if we're looking at the God who all He can do is help people not be stingy, if He can't multiply fishes and, and fish and loaves, friend, we've got a problem. He breathed the stars in place. He created us, knit us together in our mother's womb, thinks about us all the time, loves us all the time. My God is a supernatural God, and this supernatural God will enable us to finish the race. Amen. Thank you, Miss Barber. Praise the Lord. He's a creative God. He's a, he is a miracle-working God, and I love him. Do you love him, church? And listen, God, listen, I know, I know you're fighting. I know you're fighting, church. And listen, I'm not preaching this sermon to get you to start fighting. I'm preaching this sermon to help you keep fighting and fighting all the way to the finish. I'm preaching this sermon, church. I'm not preaching this sermon so that you'll be the fellowship of the unashamed. I believe you are the fellowship of the unashamed. I'm not preaching this sermon to get you to, to start believing the Bible. I'm preaching this sermon so that we keep believing the Bible, that we keep running the race. I believe in what God is doing in the life of our church, in your life. Now listen, we are fighting. We are in perilous times. I talked to a buddy just for a few minutes this week, and he said, oh, I hadn't seen him in years. He said, buddy, we are in perilous times. I said, yes, we are in perilous times. We are in troubled times. We are in times that give us heartache and times that cause suffering in our life. But church, listen, God has placed us in these times. God has put us here for a purpose and a reason. God puts lights in dark places. And God has transferred us from a kingdom of darkness into a kingdom of light. We're going to talk about that this morning. And so the fourth thing and I want to share with you today of, how, of what it is that keeps us going, what it is that causes us to finish, and that is experiencing the kingdom of Jesus. Experiencing the kingdom of Jesus. Now, you say, where in the world do you get that from, Pastor Brandon? Look with me at verse 13. 1 Timothy 6, verse 13. He says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things, who gives life to us. He doesn't just give us physical life. He's given us spiritual life. 
and of Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate. All right, pastor, what in the world? Where are you getting this from? And Christ Jesus who testified the good confession. I want you to, I want you to zero in on this, this phrase, good confession. Well, guys, we got to ask ourselves a question. What is the good confession? What is it that Jesus professed, confessed to Pontius Pilate? What is this good confession? I'm so glad that you ask because it is what this whole sermon is about. And y'all listen, unless we study our Bibles, we, we just read by this stuff. We don't find out exactly what is the Bible talking about. The good confession. And when did Jesus testify this confession? Look here with me, you can turn there, you can look on the screen, John chapter 18. <clears throat> Verse 36. John chapter 18, verse 36, Jesus answered, my kingdom, everybody say my kingdom, is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore, Pilate said to him, so you are a king. So you are a king. Ooh, let's stop here for a moment. The good confession is about to be made. The good confession when everything Related to the life of Jesus, his death, what he's facing at this moment, everything is in jeopardy. Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, the King of kings, the Lord of lords is standing here. And all he had to say is, nah, I'm not a king. But Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born. For this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. The good, the good confession here is Jesus declaring that he is the king. That his kingdom is not of this world. This, his kingdom is not of this realm. The first part of his confession here, the good confession is, I am a king. The second part of his confession is, the purpose for which uh, me coming into the world is to testify to the truth. I am a king and I have come into the world. It is telling us, um, it is telling us who he is and it is telling us what he has come to do. He is telling us his identity. He is telling us that he is the king and he is telling us that he's come into the world to give us the truth. Not, and he's telling us that it's not of this world, that it is not of this earth. It is not of this realm, not of this world. That's good to know, amen, church? That our king... When it says of here, my, that his kingdom is not of this world. Say, Pat, a part of pastor's, uh, Pastor Brandon's sermon today was to define the word of. What does that mean? What does it mean that his kingdom is not of this world? I actually studied the word of. Y'all, I have read more pages about the word of from this text than you can imagine. What does this mean that Jesus' kingdom is not of this world? I'm so glad that you ask. Basically, it means that the source of 
the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, the source, the source of its power, the source of his coming into the world is not of this world. It is of, an, of another realm. It is also the origin of his kingdom is not of this world. Jesus here is in the world, but he is not of the world. It didn't come from the world. His power doesn't come from the world. His power is not simply natural. You see, when you, when you dumb down the story of, of the loaves and, and fish, you're basically saying his kingdom of, is of this world. But his kingdom is not of this world. The source of his power is not of this world. His ability to breathe the stars in place did not come from this world. His power to create this world did not come from this world. Jesus came into this world from another world, from another realm. Aren't you glad? Guys, listen, when we praise people and we look to people that are of this world and of this realm to solve, I know I keep getting into this, to solve our problems, we're off on the wrong, we're off on the wrong path. We are looking to a different king. We are looking to a, to a unique source. We are looking to the only source of our strength and the power of God to transfer people from a kingdom of this world to the kingdom of life, to a kingdom of light, to another kingdom. I'm so glad that this kingdom, the earthly kingdoms of this world, uh, are not what we are living for, what we are hoping in. We see them all assembled for the Olympics, for the Olympic Games and all these things and all these competitions and all of these limitations and all of these things that happen. The good, the bad, the, the, the triumphs and the defeats and all of the things that wrap up. And we love watching that. But y'all, this is not what this, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ is about. It's not about eating and drinking. It's not about competing against uh, each other in physical power or against physical armies or wars or powers or rumors of wars or all the things that happen on this, world, on this earth. We are absolutely so limited, aren't we? of what we can endure. We just look out on the horizon. We look out at the, at the weather radars and we look at, wow, this storm is generating and starting and what the potential is, is if it gets out over hot water, man, what it could turn into and what it's gonna have, catastrophic events, and nobody can hold this thing back. Nobody can stop this stuff. Earthquakes, the, the earth opens up and starts to swallow stuff. Well, how do you stop that? I don't know. All we can do is try to get a good warning system for all this stuff. Still haven't watched the Twisters movies. That's a whole other thing. Whole other thing. Tornadoes and all of these things, fires, you know, guys are just hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres of fires and we're trying to, we're trying to fight fires, we're trying to fight storms, we're trying to protect ourselves. It's like little ants running around trying to protect ourselves, boarding ourselves up, running from waves. I mean, y'all, if that doesn't cause us to to um, look at ourselves and our kingdoms lightly and to look at the, the hopes of man and what man can do, it should really cause us pause. Just look at the weather for a little while and say, okay, God, I got to trust in you. I got to trust in your power, the source of your strength. It's from another realm. And that power, that kingship, that authority, that glory, guys. Listen, that God has come to this earth in the person of Jesus Christ to open up our lives, to open up our hearts, and to show us, to show us who God is. To open blind eyes, to heal the lame and the sick, and to, and to prove to us. And listen, all these, all these preachers, oh, God, help us, these preachers that want to water down the miracles of Jesus and limit his power. You know, what, you know what happens when you start limiting the power of Jesus and the authority of Scripture and the miracles of Jesus? You're just bringing man up. They're just bringing themselves up. You know what this guy, this guy said? He said, we need to be less concerned about the truth of God's Word and more concerned about uh, practicing and doing our good deeds. 
And, and I would say, you know, we really kind of need both. You know, we need to do good things. But guys, without the truth, without the glory, without the power, we're just elevating ourselves and saying we can do what we now believe God can't do. You know, a lot of times the faithless give up. Listen, the faithless give up on the gospel. They give up on the power of the gospel. Do you know why they give up on the power of the gospel? Because they've lost their lampstand. They've offended God. They've offended God. And he has removed their lampstand. And then they can only see and only experience what man can do in their worship services, in their small groups, in and through their church, they're only seeing what man can do. And that would get discouraging after a while. Not seeing miracles, not seeing people saved, not seeing people being called into ministry, not seeing people wanting to go across the, all over the earth and preach the gospel, not seeing young students want to witness to their friends and share the gospel with people around. That doesn't happen where there's no lampstand. They've offended God. He's not working that way in that place anymore because they've elevated themselves and they've reduced God into this maybe a genie in the bottle or maybe perhaps the greatest psychologist, psychiatrist that's ever lived. My God's a whole lot bigger than that God. And in fact, I just want to declare to you today <laughs> that I really can't do anything for you. I got nothing for you. All I have for you is, all I have to give you is this beautiful gospel, this good news, that by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that if you'll surrender to him, that if you'll give your life to him, he'll totally radically change you from the inside out. He will give you hope. He will give you peace. He will give you life. He will give you his creative power. The spirit that raised Christ from the dead will come and live inside of you. And then I would say, you know, really, he's got everything for you. I got nothing. It puts us on a totally different place, doesn't it? Where the preacher's saying, I got nothing for you, but he's got everything for you. You know why? Because you know what he did? He took a few fish and some loaves and he fed 5,000 people. <laughs> Amen. That's awesome. He took people with blind eyes and opened their eyes. He took people who were lame. There didn't maybe, some scholars believe there was no, not even any bones in the man's leg, legs. And he picked him up and he said, take up your mat and walk. Peter did this under the power of the Holy Spirit. God did this. And God can do these things. He is a miracle working God. And his kingdom has come for us to experience him. He came to this world from another realm. And then he ascended back into the heavenly realm. Y'all read the scriptures. I'm not going to have time to do it today. I'm going to skip a few texts um, that I'm not going to be able to get to. But y'all, he ascended back into that realm. How many of y'all believe in the ascension of Jesus? How many of you believe in the resurrection of Jesus? How many of you believe in the rapture of Jesus? Oh, hold on a minute, Pastor. I don't, I don't believe in a rapture. Well, guess what Jesus did? He was raptured into heaven. Well, I don't know about that. He's going to get off on the rapture. He's going to figure out a way to preach about the rapture. You know what, too, the Bible says? That he will come back from that realm and receive us unto himself. You know what it says in John 14, 3, I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, somebody say, where I am, where is he? In another realm. That where I am, there you may be also. Sounds like a rapture. Y'all want to go through this again? I mean, if, if God can raise, if God can resurrect Jesus and rapture Jesus, do you think he can rapture his church? 
And from what I'm reading in John 14, 3, that's what he said he's going to do. You know what else it says in Romans 6, 5? For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. In the likeness. Everybody say likeness. Well, how was Jesus resurrected and raptured? Maybe we will be resurrected and raptured. Come on, somebody. I'm going to prove this to some of y'all before it's over with. We'll move on. First, the reason Pastor Brandon is talking about the kingdom today is because of Jesus' good confession that he is a king. Everybody understand where we are. Point number one, knowing Christ Jesus who testified the good confession, the confession of his kingdom, the good confession of that kingdom, number one. Number two, Jesus, part of this kingdom, the whole idea of the kingdom, and I cannot in one sermon describe the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm not going to try to do that. We're just going to look at a certain aspects of it. One major aspect. Jesus rescues people from darkness and transfers people to his kingdom. The kingdom of life and the kingdom of light. Colossians 1, 13. This is a pivotal verse for our day. For he, Jesus, rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Redemption meaning our purchased, we have been purchased. And we look at it just for a minute. Can we read this just one more time? For he rescued us. Who's us? The church. Us, whenever Paul is talking about us, he is grouping himself together in Colossians with the church at Colossae. He's saying us, he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. How many firefighters we got in here? Let's just honor our firefighters just for a moment. We got an almost firefighter. And Duke, we, you can raise your hand. Even though Duke's got a little bit of testing. Raise your hand. If you are in tra- about to be a firefighter, hopefully, or you are a firefighter, raise your hand. No, just stand up. Just stand up. Firefighter, stand up. Hold up. Come on. Duke, stand up just for a second. Terry. And you know where the rest of them are? They're at the firehouse, okay? Because the firehouse don't, doesn't stop. These are, y'all, I don't know. Y'all get around our firefighters. They are, they are the most amazing people in the world. You know, everybody's running out of the fire. They're running into the fire. Firefighters are incredible. And that's not, maybe the hardest part for them is, is running into circumstances and situations where people are dying, people are sick, people are hurt, people are injured, people have been in accidents, wrecks, and all these things that these guys do. They run into things that we just stand back and go, oh, I don't know what to do. Any of y'all that person? I'll pray for you. <laughs> But I'm not going to try to get your heart going again. I don't know how to do that. I mean, I, I will do it if nobody else is around. Dawson, if you go down, I'm going to come, I'm going to try to help you. I won't just leave you there. I'm supposed to breathe into his mouth. I'm supposed to do some compressions. I'm supposed to do something. And so we'll just try everything until you start breathing again, buddy. But these guys are amazing. These guys are, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, think about the scenario of, of a firefighter running in, someone is trapped, someone is in a, in a burning building, someone is trapped, and this has happened thousands of, hundreds of thousands of times. They run in, they grab hold of a person, and they rescue them. They put them in the ambulance, they transfer them to a hospital, and then the hospital brings healing into their life. Y'all, this in a physical sense is, is uh, looking at what Christ has done in a powerful spiritual sense that he has come into this world from another realm from another world into this world to rescue us from the dominion of darkness to transfer us into a kingdom of life and light and forgiveness in this heroic do y'all look at Jesus as your hero amen 
And it's something I can't do for myself. You know, religion and all of this stuff, y'all, all of this stuff that's coming at us and hitting us and all on the internet about, about uh, rabbis and people that want to tell you how that you can earn your way to God, how you can work your way to God. And really the, the helplessness and hopelessness and reality is that we, we can't do this on our own. That he has rescued us from a dominion of darkness. Let's look at this just for a moment. Uh, so rescued, transferred, forgiven was what we're looking at, but rescued, let's look at this. What has he rescued us from, delivered us from, set us free? Rescued meaning delivered from, set free from. Dominion, this word dominion, what has he set us from, set us free from? The dominion of darkness. This is the, the dominion of darkness from this scripture is the rule and power and authority of Satan over people's lives. This is where we are when Jesus comes to get us. We are under the dominion and the rule and the authority of Satan. We're in his realm, the prince and power of this air. Jesus Christ reaches into that realm, reaches into that darkness, reaches into our life and rescues us from this authority, this power and delivers us from it, completely sets us free from the dominion of Satan over our life. Man, that makes me excited. Amen, church. Y'all ought to be a whole lot more excited about what Jesus has done for us when we talk about this and transferred us to the kingdom of Jesus. That, that is the picture of what Jesus does in his churches. Wherever he is on the throne, wherever he is placed and worshiped as king, that's what he does. That's what we watch him do. That's what we are participating in. When we are preaching the gospel, when we are planting seeds, when we are loving people, when we are leading them to Christ, y'all, that is what Crossroads Baptist Church, that is what we do. That is what we are a part of. That is why we are here. That is what this ministry is all about. It is about being a part of what he's doing, doing what he's called us to do, using our gifts and our abilities to serve the Lord Jesus Christ so that he will rescue people, rescue them, deliver them, and transfer them to his kingdom. <laughs> this is not a place to come and sit and soak on Sunday. This is not a place to just hang out. This is not a place to just hear a sermon. I am not up here preaching a sermon so that you will hear a sermon. We are not called to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word of God. We are here to be a part of what God is doing. We are here to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We are here to honor him with our bodies. We are here to offer our bodies to him as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is why we live holy lives. This is why we live servant lives. This is why we give ourselves to his ministry so that we can watch him deliver people. Rescue people from the dominion of Satan. Y'all, I hope that you will think just for a moment, please, please go with me just for a second. Christians, when you are looking out at the world right now, when you are looking out at the world right now and you get upset, you get mad, you get angry about what's going on in the world, listen to me, church. Please listen to me. Stop getting mad. Stop getting angry at people in the world that are living under the dominion and authority of Satan in their life. Stop acting like, listen, Christians, will you please open your heart to this idea? 
Stop looking out at the world saying, I can't believe they can't get this. They can't get it right. They can't think correctly. They can't act right. They can't think right. Why can't they just get this? This is so easy. Yes, it is easy for a person who's been rescued from the dominion and authority of Satan in their lives that have been transferred into the kingdom of light and have been forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ and indwelt with the Holy Spirit, yes, it's easy to understand right and wrong. It's illuminated to us every time we open the Bible. But y'all look at me, listen to me. The people in this world, the people that are living under the domain of Satan in their life, they cannot understand what you and I understand. They need the grace of God. And they need missionaries who love them to lead them to the truth, to lead them to understand the gospel. Please stop hating unbelievers. Please stop hating people that need deliverance and to be rescued from the dominion of darkness. And please stop acting like you hate people that just can't get it. If they could just get it through their thick skulls. Look at me. We would be saying that about you if you were still under the domain of Satan, the dominion and authority of Satan in your life. You would be, I'm just looking at the front row here, you guys would be the dirtiest rotten scoundrels there are on planet Earth. And you were before you came to Christ. I've heard some of y'all's testimonies. The good, the bad, and the ugly are sitting among us. This is not a church full of hypocrites because we know we're a mess without Jesus. We know we would be under this dominion of darkness. We know that there would no, be no comprehension of spiritual truth without the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Look at me, church. Hey, religious Pharisees, stop it. Stop it. Stop walking around judging the world for what they're doing. God has called us to judge ourselves of what's going on in our life. God's going to do the judging at the end. Our responsibility, our responsibility is to be the missionaries of God that will lose our lives for the gospel, that will, that will scrape and claw our way to get to them so that somehow we will have the opportunity to plant the seeds of the gospel in their life, to sow the seed of the gospel into their life, to love them and to minister to them and to give cups of cold water to them, to visit them in prison, to visit them, to give, bring food to them if they're hungry, to bring clothing to them if they don't have clothes, to be, to be Christ, hands and feet to the world. Somebody say amen. They are in a dominion of satanic dominance in their life. Stop being a Pharisee. Be a disciple. Be a missionary to them. Listen, it, it, there, there is something to pray about today. If your heart has grown cold and callous toward hurting, lost, dead soul people, listen, you need to be the first one at the altar today crying out to God, God, heal my hard heart toward lost people. You get transferred out of that 15, 20, 30 years ago and you forget how powerful that dominion of Satan is over people's lives. This is why we do what we do, church. To see people in our community rescued. To see people in our community set free. Set free free from Satan's hold and power over their lives. Man, we go off to Bible school, we go off to seminary, 
to go learn all this stuff and then forget why we're doing all this? How many of you say right now, Pastor Brandon, I want to see people, I want to see them rescued. I want to see them freed from a dominion of darkness, a dominion of, of satanic bondage over their life. <laughs> then I need you to sign up for bus ministry today. <laughs> wow, that was the greatest pitch ever for bus ministry. And Awana, <laughs> I need you to sign up for Awana. I need you to join a D group. Why do we do what we do? Let me just, why do we have those four Houston area transit buses sitting out there? They have been for our brother deacon ray edwards probably a thorn in his side y'all ray has probably fixed every part that could be put on these vans people have looked out at those especially when they had the big huge orange red stripe and the big ugly blue stripe on them do y'all remember that now it's beautiful crossroads baptist church they look so good but on the inside is full of dead man's bones They are ugly, maybe, to you. I don't know. Well, you're thinking, why do we do this? Maybe you're a parent and you're bringing your kids here and you're like, man, I don't know why we're doing this. I don't know why we're bringing it. Listen, right now, and this is coming from the heart of the, the bus ministry team. And y'all, if you could look in their eyes and you hear from their hearts, they really love, they really, really love these children. And they really want these kids to be rescued and to be transferred to the kingdom of light. And y'all, we've been doing bus ministry since I've been here. We've been doing a long time. We've worn out some buses. Y'all remember the old school bus? And what about the old prison bus that we finally painted, that we painted it red and it didn't look so much like a prison, prison bus anymore? The kids, the ki you go pick up kids in a prison bus, they're like, where are you taking us? <laughs> and y'all, it's hard. It's hard. It, it is sacrifice and it, it's hard. But we got a lot, of, a lot of people in this room that love these children. And we right now, we right now, we have to take three buses to pick up elementary kids. And the, the volunteers from the bus ministry, their heart is that we continue to pick up middle school children. They, the, the heart is we have been picking these kids up. We know these kids. We love these kids, these children. And we want to pick, pick them up in middle school as well. And this is, a, this is a hard thing. This is a thing we've really thought through and prayed through and, and are working through. And it is still a work in progress. But this means a fourth bus. What we realize is that we, we, we're going to pick up middle schoolers on a bus. And they're going to have their own bus. And they actually, we have two leaders right now that have volunteered from the bus ministry to lead that middle, middle school bus ministry that are going to love these kids from the time they get on the bus till the time they get dropped back off at their house. Share the gospel with them and love them and minister to them and bring them into our student ministry. All the stuff that happens here. <laughs> Sow these seeds into their life so that somehow they'll be rescued and transferred to the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ and forgiven of all their sin and made new, made new, made a new creature, a new creation for a lifetime, y'all. They Listen, you can't get rid of the Holy Spirit. Once the Holy Spirit comes and takes residence in your life, that Holy Spirit is there forever, forever. It's what we believe the gospel teaches us in the New Testament. And so, with that said, expanding, okay, we're expanding a ministry that is already weak. Let's be honest, it's already weak. 
and we're wanting to expand it. That, those are the kinds of things that churches do because we feel like God is leading us to do this, but we don't really know how in the world it's going to happen because it's going to take a God thing for it to happen. Um, it's it's going to have to be a God thing. And honestly, the God thing is going to have to probably happen in here right now. <laughs> right now. With a few of y'all getting cut to the heart by the Holy Spirit and saying, you, you buddy, y'all ever had the Holy Spirit just tap on you and say, and some of y'all are like, I ain't doing this. I'm checking out right now. I ain't listening to another word this man says. But the Holy Spirit pricks your heart. And so in this process, we're also expanding the volunteers that we need. We need three leaders on a bus. We need a bus driver, and all that bus driver does is drive the bus. And we have two monitors. This having three on there is just makes things so much safer for everybody. It makes it a healthier environment. It's, it makes a healthier ministry. And so we need two, two adults and potentially students. I just want to look at y'all real, real quick. If you're in high school, you are on the hook right now. Okay, I am casting the line and I am reeling you in right this second. We need you. We, we need you to be a part of this. And, he, and here's the thing. Bus ministry, some people might think, man, if we can just get there, if we can get everybody on the bus safe, we can get them here safe. Yes, that is a first goal, uh, getting them back home safe. But the second goal is to minister to them from the time they get on the bus to the time, all the time that they're on the bus and the time, the time they go home. Gospel conversation. You want a place to, to start witnessing, then join bus ministry. If you're a high school student, if you're a college student, um, and you want to join this team, we need you. We need three leaders on the bus, from high school to adults, on the bus, on four buses. We're expanding this. Last year, we would have two. We'd have a bus driver and a monitor. We need a bus driver and two monitors. The bus driver, we need bus drivers who know when they get on the bus, I'm not going to have to worry about anything but driving the bus because they're, they're taking care of the ministry, the behavior, and loving and ministering to kids. I'm just going to be safe and drive the bus. So some of y'all are saying right now, I'm going to drive a bus because if all I got to do is drive a bus, but don't you dare make me have to deal with problems while I'm driving the bus. I don't know how our county bus drivers drive the bus and also deal with the behavior on the bus. Somehow they do it. We don't want you to have to do that. That means we can fit 12 students we have to stay at 15. That means we can fit 12 students, 12 children on each bus coming here. But that means that we need 12 <laughs> workers every Wednesday night, guys, that will, guys and gals that will drive the bus. You do not need a CDL license to drive the bus. And we need monitors. We need high school students that will sign up today and say, I, I will be a volunteer. Guys, we need more volunteers than 12 because people aren't able to be here. Bus drivers aren't able to be here. We need backup drivers. We need guys that say, listen, if you need somebody last minute, I'll do it. I don't want to do it all the time, but I'll do it some of the time. I'll do it when I'm in town. Uh, a schedule, and it's very efficient. We're going to train you. We're going to equip you how to do this. But guys, listen, if we're going to ex expand this ministry then we need volunteers today that are pricked to the heart that say, Pastor Brandon, I'll sign up to be here on Wednesday nights to do bus ministry. Guys, this isn't just one example. Listen, what are we going to be? Are we going to be a church? Are we going to be a ministry? Are we going to be a mission ministry? Amen. Are we just going to talk about what everybody, all these crazy people in this world are doing and how nuts it is? I saw that man beating up that girl in the, in the uh, boxing ring at the Olympics. I know a committee met about this. They let that man in there beating up that girl. Y'all, you know what would happen to me if I started hitting a girl? When I was a kid. And you want to judge all that? You want to say how in the world could that all happen? Y'all look at me. Look at me. Stop complaining about what's going on in the world if you're not willing to be a part of the mission of Christ on this earth. 
You mean we're just going to complain about what everybody's doing, but we're not going to be a part of sowing the seed of the gospel in people's lives? Look at me, church. Look at me. And I, I want to say this with all the grace I can have in my life. You are a Christian and you have not shared Christ with one person in the last year? In the last year, you have not witnessed to one person on this earth, and yet you want to complain about everything you see on cable news? Realize, Pharisee, you are a part of the problem. You are not thinking and realizing that God has put you here to be salt and to be light in this world for the glory of God. He has commissioned you. He, did, he has saved you for a purpose. I got a whole other sermon to preach next week about this. So let me say it this way to close. I do not believe, Crossroads, that we are a sit and soak congregation I believe we are a I believe we are a go and tell I believe we are a fellowship of the unashamed I was 22 21 22 years old we just had Stephen I'm pastoring my first church and we titled it, it was Chattahoochee Baptist Church and you know what the tag was a fellowship of the unashamed that was not a fellowship of the unashamed, I'm sad to say. The church I was pastoring, I was the youngest active adult. And there were very few Christians that I could tell from the fruit in their life. There were a few Christians there, a few truly born again believers. But it was a, it was a serious house of Pharisees had never done a mission outreach, had not done a mission outreach in decades. Any kind of mission, any kind of outreach, any kind of anything outside the walls of the church in decades. And so now, 30, 28, how old is Stephen? I don't know how old he is. Anyway, 28 years later, 30, 29, whatever. I get to be a part of a fellowship of the unashamed. I get a I get to be a part of a church that is courageous. I get to be a part of a church that's working so hard and is not on the sidelines. You're not in the stands. You're not on the sidelines. You are all in the game, and I love you for it. And I know when I preach really hard sometimes, and I'm talking about maybe what some of you aren't, I'm, and you're sitting there going, Pastor, I'm working so hard. I'm serving the Lord, and I'm faithful. I'm a faithful servant of the Lord. Well, well done. Well done. My good and faithful servants. Amen. That's what we'll hear him say when we do the hard things. When we do the things we know are right. And when we share the gospel in the middle of darkness. When we share and we're unashamed. And we do not care what anybody thinks. And we just be who Christ has called us to be in this world. But I invite you church today to join in in somewhere, join in in preschool ministry, join in in kids ministry, join in in bus ministry, join in in witnessing and sharing your faith, join in being a missionary of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Transfer your membership from the spectator in the stands to the person in the game. And let's go. Let's go. What have they been saying in the stands? Every time, every time these little gymnast, that little girl, what, Simone Bob, man, that little girl flipping all over there. I was just like, what? And what do they say? Let's go. Let's go. Y'all church, let's go. Let's do this. And I'm saying that looking at what you're doing, but also saying what, what's next for us? What is on the horizon? What is God calling us to be a part of? Get in a D group, get in a life group, get in a place where your spirit is inspired and encouraged and built up and equipped to be ready for the fight, to be in his kingdom. 
fighting the good fight of faith. Let's pray. Father, bless.